you guys are going to show my slides because my new computer is not cooperating. So go to the next slide, you guys. And actually, I just wanted to make a couple comments to make this more interactive. I think one of the things um, to answer Zach's question, I think I'll show this, but our sample is only 32 years old now. So they're not really, they're a, they are getting older like all of us, but they're not aged. Um, but they have decreased considerably. And I think I'll show this in irritability and hyperactivity, um, but not in anxiety. Um, and actually depression went up, particularly for the women. So I think it's, I mean, that. I think that fits. I mean, we don't have the same samples, but we are young. Our group is younger than Hilda and her group. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens. So I have the same conflict of interest I had before. I, the one other thing I wanted to say that I should have said before about diagnosing in, in, in adults is I do think that the people that at least I've seen here not only have mental health issues often, as well as autism, but also often life problems. So they don't, they're not working in jobs that are as good as they really should. They, they, they are educated for, they are, there are many life frustrations. And I think one of the things that comes back to what Jeremy was saying in terms of follow-up is I think we feel like we're scrambling to get services for people that where we we do know how to treat the mental health issues, but but we trying to find appropriate social services or job coaches or somebody um, you know is really tough. So changing the topic back today, I'm gonna right now I'm gonna talk about our early diagnosis study, which consists of 253 children referred for possible autism when they were two, followed until they are they are now about 32 years old. So we know these families and um, children. We did not have participant workshops when we started <laughs> because they were two, but we did talk to families. And um I want to give examples of different outcomes for people of autism with and without intellectual disabilities. And I think related to what Hilda and her group said is it really becomes increasingly important to make that distinction. Although I think we're doing it in a much more clumsy way than probably we should. And to ask, what do we know? What don't we know? And what does this mean um, for all of us? Next slide. We have, okay, so this, this study was started with multiple measures. We used both parent reports with the little kids and direct observations and direct testing. We had 192 consecutive referrals for ASD. So not all of them had ASD, but they were referred for ASD. 21 kids who were two-year-olds who had some kind of developmental delay, but theoretically not autism. We added 54 more kids at about age nine who had had early diagnosis. The sample is mostly boys, 75% boys. Um, so not a lot of females, although we have some. It's also about 75% um, white, about 20% African-American and 5% rest. What is unusual about it is that we have families from North Carolina, Michigan, and Illinois. We have more than half of our families are actually rural families. And this is not a group of upper middle class families. These were uh, early diagnoses for free, uh, starting at TEACH. Um, and so th that it is different from most of the studies. Okay, next slide, please. Actually, can you go, go one more slide after this? One more forward. One more, one more. <laughs> okay, so we have managed to see these families at two, three, four, five, nine, um, we also had a break at 19 where we did long interviews at 14 on the phone. Um, but again, because of funding, didn't see them at 19. We've seen them at 21, 25, and 30. Um, and um, right now we have 157 uh, participants actively involved. So we've lost about 40% of the sample, although people come back all the time when they remember us and tell us that we've moved. We also have sent packets and questionnaires every three to six months um, for the whole time. And I think one of the most interesting things for us 
was that although we could establish that you could make a diagnosis at two, um, the reality is, and I'll show you, some people have moved out of this spectrum. Um, technically, they had an autism diagnosis, so they could still use it if they wanted, but really don't appear to be autistic at all. And other people who didn't have a diagnosis will now get one at 25. And I, I think it's also really important to remember that many of the outcomes of our comparison participants who are people referred for autism who don't have it, or the 21 developmentally delayed people are very similar when you control for intellectual disability or not. Um, there, diff there are differences, but the, many of the practical issues are the same. Okay, now go backwards, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, one more. Yeah. So I think a couple of really quick things that we have found. This is replicating work that Marsha Malik's group did. So she may talk about this later. But we, because we can't follow these same people for so long, we've been able to look at changes within them. And one of the things that we found that Marsha had initially reported is that violent scores, um, so actually do go down. Um, uh, after people leave structured schooling. Um, and so I think this is of great concern and we, we're trying to figure out which scores and why. Next slide, please. But I think it's an important thing about that whole cliff. Um, we also have found, I think much to our surprise that th this is using Julie Taylor's vocational index, but just that on the whole, people were quite stable in the kinds of activities that they participated in from young adulthood into older adulthood. And the reason why this is important is that we meet many parents, particularly of um, more able, more cognitively able people who really hope that their kid is gonna just snap into um, easily getting a job when they graduate from college or um, even before then, or they're not even going to high school, but they think that somehow everything is going to emerge. And at least in our sample, it was very predictable um, who was going to make it in regular society. Um, and that we created a 10 code, which is really full-time employment, which is not something most of our um, participants have, but it is possible. But those people who got it were working part time before that and um, managing to go to school. And so we just need to try to figure out how to help people more get started earlier, not necessarily in working, but ways that lead to working. Okay, then go forward. Sorry, you guys, two slides. <laughs> We, yeah. So our goals for the last few years, as our participants have um, gotten older, is to better understand the opportunities and barriers for them, define what are achievable positive outcomes. And I think we've been similar to Hilda and her students in, in focusing on things that can be changed and relate current outcomes backwards so we can give adv better advice about what people can do. Next slide, please. So, and then just go ahead and fill this slide in. You guys, it's animated. So one of the ways that we organized, and this is work by Jamie McCauley, um, a postdoc with us who's now a faculty member, but was how can we organize the degree to which people have autonomy and independence? And this does involve some judgments, which I think we talked over with many of our participants and their parents, but. This is not the answer for all times, but we decided we would take sort of Autistica and the World Health Organization's organ organization of having a role in the community, which we defined as having a friend, at least one friend, living independently, we defined as living on your own, um, and uh, being able uh, to pay for most of what you're spending, and current work was a full-time job. And so what you'll see here is along the bottom is the green are people that sort of met the initial criteria and the pink is didn't come close. And then the um, uh, uh, orange and blue are somewhere in between. 
And when you add this all up, when we look at how many people, and this is of our group without intellectual disability, and I should say here, we define this as an IQ over 70, but the mean IQ for people in this group is actually over 100. So it's, it's really average. Um, and so you can see that we have about a third of the sample doing well in terms of these three domains. We also have a quarter of the sample who's not doing anything, which means they're not doing anything in the day, they're living with their parents and they're socially isolated. And then we have a substantial group in the middle. Um, and I think this is not saying, this says more about us and the services we provide than about them. Next slide. What, one of the things that we were very surprised at was also changes in diagnosis. And so the way these slides are made is each line, it, the, the end points at age two on the left and age three, uh, age 25 on the right are determined by us. So those, are, those were fixed endpoints. But what we were interested in was how did people get from two to 25 if their diagnosis changed? So if you look at, look at the bottom left slide, I think that's the simplest. And here you'll see that the blue line are people who had a diagnosis at age two. This is all people without intellectual disability and also had it at 25 done independently by a different examiner who was blinded to the initial diagnosis. So that is the biggest group. We also have the red line, which is people down at the bottom who never had a diagnosis and who still didn't have a diagnosis at 25. And these are ADOS calibrated severity scores. So they range from zero or really one to 10. 10, 10 does not mean the most severe the affected person, it means you had the most symptoms during an ADOS, that just that. But what is interesting is if you look at the green line, we had people who absolutely met criteria for autism at age two, who at 25 do not, excluding historical diagnosis. And so what's interesting though there is when you look at, we saw them at two, five, nine, and 19, their scores went down gradually. We also have a small group of people and that's the gold line who did not meet autism criteria at two and then who did at 25. And the same thing, if you look at the lines, the changes are linear. So they gradually accumulated um, autism symptoms on an ADOS. And this is true both for social affect, if you look up at the top, and repetitive behavior. And we were really surprised by this. Okay, next slide. So, and then go ahead and put the animation in. So we also separated outcomes for autistic adults with limited language or intellectual disability. And the logic here was just, there is no point in saying that somebody who needs to live in a situation where someone is taking care of them um, isn't independent. That's not a question, but what we wanna know is what about their community and social life? Um, what about the activities they are participating in? And, what are, and then we decided in terms of independence that we would use daily living skills. So here we use the Vineland and age eight um, at age 25. Um, and we used age eight because at age eight on the Vineland, you, people can do um, hygiene, they can do dressing, they can do all self-care and a little bit of chores. And that seemed like a reasonable place. And in fact, you'll see here that about half of the sample reported, their families reported for them because these are people that could not report for themselves, that they did have a person in their life who was not a staff and not a relative whom they really enjoyed being with who they saw regularly. Daily living skills, we had just less than half, about 40% of the sample who actually were taking care of their own daily living skills. So it was possible for this group, even though they are people on the average, their IQs, nonverbal is about 40, 45, verbal about 30 to 35. So quite delayed. 
and current activities, and I think this is the most heartbreaking, we had about half the sample who were doing almost nothing outside the home. Now we need to be careful because I think some of these families and some of these people were quite happy with what they were doing at home. And so this is our concern that if they never get outside their home, what does this mean if something happens to their parents as their parents are hitting their 60s and 70s? But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're miserable. When we look up at the total thing, I think what's important here as a society is to realize how many people who fall in this range are not getting sufficient support services and are socially isolated. Okay, next slide. So when we look at their trajectories in terms of the ADOS, and this also partially reflects the limitations of the ADOS, you can see there are very large differences <laughs> between the groups at age two in terms of who got autism diagnoses, who didn't get autism diagnoses. But what we see is by 25, basically these groups are indistinguishable or almost indistinguishable in terms of autism symptoms. And there we can still find subtle differences if we really look for it. But on the whole, what is most significant here is just the change is the merger. Um, next slide. So we also wanted to clarify that subjective outcome is different than objective. That is how happy people are and how what their quality of life is, is not necessarily met by meeting milestones. And so here we asked parents um, to do, fill out a variety of different measures that had to do with well-being, quality of life, and then happiness. Literally, they just checked off different adjectives that they said would describe their young person. Um, and for the more verbal young adults, we had them do this for themselves. And what we found was there is a relationship to some degree with the objective measures. For example, people are describing themselves or their adult children as happier if they're doing things that we can objectify. But there also is a separate factor. And for less verbal young adults, that factor was also related to parent reports of hyperactivity and aggression. And again, I think it's important to note this, um, but we don't have reports from these individuals about themselves. For more verbal young adults, there was a very different pattern, which was that happiness and well being, again, were related to objective measures, the objective measures that we had about employment, live, living, and friends, but they were also related to self reported mood, anxiety, and depression, which is not surprising. And I think our next question is what contributes to happiness and well-being? And one of the things we're really trying to understand now is what are people doing during the day that and the evening that they enjoy and what makes this difference? Next slide. So I think we can ask why are developmental pathways and trajectories important? I think people already covered this, but we really did want to know what can we predict about what is ahead? And we can predict a lot of things, although we need to be very, very careful. I mean, we're up to age 32 um, and there's some things you can predict. For example, diagnosis of autism is possible at age two, but we also know that sometimes it changed. We can select goals for intervention, that things that are going to change anyway that we don't need to worry about. And knowing when to intervene um, is also an important piece of information. Next slide. So um, this is a slide from um, the Lancet, but I think the point here is these are some things that we've been able to identify um, as milestones at different periods of time. And if you um, see these slides later, you can spend a little more time looking at it, but we have been able at different ages to identify different predictors of both positive well-being, um, but also uh, objective independence. Next slide. <clears throat> 
And then I think key messages include that subjective and outcome me objective measures are related, but not the same. We'd like to know better how we can do subjective measures with people that are less verbal, that, that often the ASD outcomes are not that different than other people who had similar developmental dis dis disabilities, but we can't deny or underestimate the effects of intellectual disability. And I do think we did not pull out a middle group here, so we need to be careful. But certainly if you have an IQ between 30 and 45, your life is gonna be different than if you have an IQ of 100. We also can't underestimate the importance of trajectories and maybe someday we'll be able to do a better job looking at these. Um, and we need to remember the role of families because families are very involved in many, many cases, including more cognitively able adults. Uh, next slide. I think we wanna remember strengths um, and that is something that we always get data on, but we don't know where to put it in the research literature. And many of the people in our sample, and we heard today with the parents talking and um, yesterday with the self-advocates talking the strengths and just love and interest, for example, in music make a big difference. Next slide. Um, and I think we need to remember that autism isn't all that's problematic for many families and individuals. And so we've been trying hard to remind our colleagues, for example, if somebody is out of work and you're doing CBT once a week, try to put some effort into helping them find a job, for example. Or if someone is having a marital crisis, don't just sign them up for a, a mindfulness program, even though the mindfulness may help. Also to remember strengths. Next slide. And last, I think this is also from the Lancet Commission, a slide by Andrew Pickles. The idea that if we raise the bar, that's the little red dotted line here, for better recognition, better support, and better societal adaptation. And this is also true of non-English speaking countries and non-Western you know, culture. Um, we can pull everybody up. Life will be better for people across cognitive ability. And that's what we want to do is work together to accomplish this. Thank you, everybody. Especially these families who have hung on with us for 30 years. And then there's a whole crew that I didn't even list on here. Thank you.